welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're going to talk about round eight of Sharjah Challengers, my game against a grandmaster. In round eight, I face Abdul Rahman Hisham from Egypt. He's rated 23.90, and I was super excited for the game because after playing so many 1900s, I'm finally playing a really strong player and not just a strong player but a grandmaster so i thought oh okay this is getting very exciting and um yeah i started the game with e4 so my opponent usually plays c5 the nidorf or uh not c6 but this one over here and um also e5 i'm mostly prepared against the nidorf uh, but I, w I was a little bit surprised to face e5 um i thought oh okay well, after knight f3, knight c6, and I played bishop c4. I thought that I played Rui Lopez in this tournament already. It was not very successful. I was not really happy about it, and I thought, let's play something a little bit more calm, maybe a little bit more boring when you're playing against a stronger opponent. Um, I thought, let's just keep it simple. So bishop c5, c3, knight f6, d3, a6, a4. Very standard developing moves. a4 to basically try to stop b5. Um, from being played so easily. d6, short castle, and bishop a7. This bishop always goes back to a7 just to make sure that it doesn't get attacked by d4 or maybe b4 by tempo. So bishop e3, I want to trade off those bishops. Um, I wouldn't mind opening up the f-file for my rook. So yeah, I was really happy to go for that, of course. So short castle, bishop takes a7, rook takes a7. And here I thought that, okay, this is pretty great for me because um, that rook is a bit strange on a7. You'd have to waste a move to put it back on a8 and to activate it at some point. So it's always good to have that rook suck on a7, right? Rook e1, knight e7. I played rook e1 with the idea that d5 cannot be played. So d5, e takes, knight takes, and the pawn on e5 is hanging. So that's why. But my opponent uh, went for knight e7, of course, because that knight is heading to g6 and potentially to f4. Knight goes to f4 pretty often um, in Italian because of the pawn structure where we see the pawn on e5 and the, the knight belongs on f4. So white is, of course, trying to counter this or try to find ways that it's not so bad to have the knight on f4, actually. So knight bd2, I simply develop knight g6, knight f1, and here comes c6, and here I thought, okay, I really want to play d4, but what I didn't like about playing d4 now is that there's knight takes e4, rook takes, and then d5, and I was not entirely sure if I'm happy with this, if this is something I'm looking for here, but I didn't want to take risks here. I really liked black's position in a way here, so that's why I didn't want to uh, allow knight takes e4 that easily, so I went for bishop b3 instead, knight h5. I was a bit surprised by this move because initially I thought that this move is not possible because of the classic knight takes e5 discovery attack. However, in this position, it's a problem to take here because after knight takes e5, queen takes h5, you lose the queen because of bishop g4. So you can't quite take on e5. You can still play d4 to survive, but of course you don't want to um, go to such lengths to um, play this move. You don't really want to play knight takes e5 here. There's other better moves. But this was initially my thought that I can take on e5, but then when my opponent actually played it, I realized, oh, maybe I should not play knight takes e5. It's probably, it seems like it's a bad idea. <laughs> anyway, I went uh, for d4. In this position, I decided to play d4 because I thought, okay, my opponent wants to play d5 at some point. So let's start um, attacking and taking space in the center by playing d4 ourselves. And I thought if e takes d4, let's say, I could maybe take with the queen, because that rook on a7 looks a little bit awkward, I will be attacking the pawn on d6, and I really like my chances here. So knight hf4 was played, and here I took on e5. Turns out that that's not great at all, but I was really confident about my chances here. I really like my position after d takes e5. Um, apparently I should have played something like g3 or knight e3, but um, I really like my move and I'll show you why. Because d takes e5, knight takes, knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes, rook takes, and rook d1. And basically in this position, it is clear that I am taking over over here. Because if black plays carelessly and simply takes on d1, rook takes d1, black loses already here. Because there's no defense on the 8th rank, either um, I checkmate on d8, or I win the bishop. Let's say black plays h6, then I win the bishop anyway on c8. So that's why 
my opponent cannot just take on d1 like that. And because of the fact that the rook is on a7, the other one, you can't just move the bishop to connect the rooks. The rooks are disconnected right now. So this rook has to go to e8, which is what my opponent actually played. But this means that I'm taking over on the d-file, and this rook is also stuck on a7, especially after the move a5. And it's really difficult to see how black can actually get out of this. You'd have to think of moves such as b5, a takes b6, rook b7, or something like this. But of course, this is um, damaging the pawn structure a lot, and it's hard to see where the harmony is in, uh, in black's position. So, king f8 was played by my opponent, knight e3, g6. And here I went for g3, which was in hindsight maybe not the most precise move, because after knight e6, knight c4, I allowed knight g5. It turns out that this is completely fine, but during the game I was a little bit disappointed in myself that I allowed a move like this, because it's threatening knight f3 check. And if I defend it with rook d3, there is bishop g4. And reinforcing the threat, and it's a little complicated. Apparently rook e3 here was better, but I, I simply thought that bishop g4 was so annoying and I didn't really know what to do with my rook, but turns out rook d6 is, uh, is fine, but it felt a bit strange to have the rooks disconnected like this, but I guess I, I was super focused on not allowing the rook to get out like this, so yeah, I didn't really want to allow this. And I actually thought that allowing bishop g4 and then play bishop d1 was in my favor, because as you can see here, I'm losing material. Bishop takes d1, rook takes d1. If I take with the other rook, I lose my exchange. I lose exchange with knight f3. So of course I take with the other rook, but then I lose a pawn on e4, which is also what happened in the game. So I gave away this pawn um, on purpose. I did it on purpose because I can play knight b6 now. And look at that rook on a7. It is completely trapped. It can't move. And if you move, then you lose exchange simply for nothing. So. While having my rooks on the d-file stacked, while having basically all, the only file that is open under control, while having this rook on a7 trapped, I have such a good position against the Grandmaster! So of course I was really excited and pumped at this stage, but after knight c5, rook d8, knight b3, I was suddenly not so sure how I'm supposed to continue here, because I have 20 minutes on the clock, my opponent is on 44 minutes right now, and it feels like there is a win here, but I can't quite find it. Remember, I'm down a pawn. My pawn is going to take the pawn on a5 if I don't defend it now. And the only way to defend it is knight c4. And if I retreat, I'm basically I'm too passive. I can't make such moves right now. So I'm basically losing the second pawn. But where is the actual win? Because so here's the thing. After knight takes a5, the knight can leave, then a5, rook a6, and the rook is slowly getting out of there. So I need to hurry up here. I went for the move rook 1d7, which turns out to be a bad move. It is equalizing the position, and um, that while I was in a better position, much better. It's hard to see what is exactly better to do here. I was thinking of the moving the other rook to d7 to simply control the seventh, uh, seventh rank. But then I thought knight c5, rook c7, knight e6, and I was not entirely sure what my plan was on the seventh rank. Maybe I could have played rook d6 here, but it doesn't really feel like I'm making much progress. And um, it felt a bit too slow, and I didn't really see what's the point of this. So yeah, that's why I decided to go for rook 1d7, uh, but after knight takes a5, rook takes, king takes, this is all force, of course, rook c7. My plan is to play rook c8, rook b8, and knight c8. But as you can probably already tell, this is not going to happen that easily. So h5, my pawn simply pushes the pawn on the king side to make sure that it's defended in a later stage of the game, or maybe in a few moves if I capture f7, then there's no pawn h7 anymore, so that's useful. I play b4, knight b3, and here I play knight c4, uh, which turns out to be the only move that is actually not losing, well, it's not an advantage anymore. Basically, all other moves are worse for white. So I'm actually really happy that I found the only move to, um, to not lose here, <laughs> because it's very tempting to play rook c8. But I calculated after king e7, so unfortunately my rook is in the way, so I can't play knight c8 check. <laughs> but my plan was to, let's say, move the rook, the king will move to f6, and I was trying to make rook b8 knight c8 work. But as I mentioned before, there's a5, and after knight c8, rook a6, and black is completely fine. 
this pawn is moving forward. Black is up two pawns, remember? I can take this pawn, but then this pawn is going to promote very soon. So this is very bad. This is very bad for me. And that's why I came to the idea that, okay, I need this rook on the seventh rank. It's the only hope I have currently while being down two pawns. Let's play knight c4. Because now I want to play knight d6, maybe take the pawn e5, and also the pawn of b7 is pinned right now in a really funny way. So maybe I can also pick that one up at some point. Would be really useful. My opponent plays f6, defending the pawn on e5, knight d6, and here my opponent made a mistake, king d8. So apparently king f8 was much better. I also thought this was the better move, just because um, king d8 does not really feel good. Um, exposing yourself to so many threats. And I thought the king had to really run away to g8, and then you can figure out some attack on the queen side somehow. But my opponent went for king d8. I went to g7 of the rook, knight c1, and here I took on b7, king c8, knight d6. But unfortunately, king b8 is possible in this line, and the rook is defended. So here I was down to three minutes, and I was very frustrated at the fact that I don't see a win. I still don't see the win. And I have this feeling that I'm probably better, but I don't know. There is knight e2 check in the, um, around the corner, grabbing my pawn on c3. And I am able to take two pawns over here, but is it really worth it? Am I actually going to be able to have a better position? What if c5 and this pawn starts pushing or a5 to trade the pawns and then this other pawn starts pushing? I was really terrified of the fact that my pawns could have really easy counterplay and I would mess up somewhere, uh, especially that I'm low on the clock. I thought I need to do something uh, about this. And also remember, we do not get 30 minutes extra added to our clocks. This is it. It's 90 minutes and 30 seconds increment every single move. So I rely on my 30 seconds every single move basically at this point, while my opponent is currently on 24 minutes. So it's rather tricky. And here I decided to go for check, 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 check and it was this position that my opponent i during the game i was very in this situation i was very upset that i was not going to win that i'm i probably threw the position but i just couldn't get myself to play on because of the time and i'm playing a gm and i thought let's just settle for the draw i'm fine with it um i i can't really find a way to win this game anymore and I thought that I don't want to risk too much but after repeating the moves basically for quite a few times and I was basically you know when you are not really feeling like it anymore you're like oh I guess we're ending the game in a draw and you know you're a little disappointed but then all of a sudden something happened king takes d6 my opponent took my knight he refused to get into the three-fold repetition. He refused it, which is insane. It is completely insane. Remember, it was this position, king c 96 so king b8. We did not repeat the three moves just yet, but king b8 would have been a three-fold repetition, and my opponent had all the opportunities, all the possibilities to claim it right now, but he took my knight, and I'm not entirely sure why he made his decision. Of course, he doesn't want to make the draw, that makes sense, but it is difficult to see how he's actually able to create any chances for himself because I'm just taking the rook, I'm losing the c3 pawn, but I'm taking the pawn on a6, which turns out to be an inaccuracy. Uh, apparently, I could take, I, I could keep the pawn on a6 and just continue with h4 and trying to grab those pawns on the king side instead. But anyway, I take the pawn on a6, e4 is played, and where is black's play really because i'm the one that is playing for a win my opponent is not really playing for a win in the worst case scenario i can trade everything off and i'll be in an end game that is completely drawn so i was really confused but i have a feeling that because i was low on the clock my opponent was trying to play on the clock for some reason somehow but i was feeling really confident that i thought king e1 f5 i'm just going with the flow and making very uh, natural moves here, bring the king over to the center, knight b5, rook a8, I want to target that g6 pawn over there, so knight d4, uh, not king, uh, h4, I, I instinctively want to play king e3, but of course it's not a good idea because of knight c2. I play h4 just to fix the pawn structure on the king side, making sure that the g6 pawn is not going anywhere, king e5, rook g8, and after king e5, I was actually sure that I was going to win, 
because I was thinking maybe knight f3, king e3, knight e5, that knight is centralized very well, but turns out that you can still win with king f4. I was not entirely sure if this was winning, but two minutes on the clock, I was a little afraid that maybe there's some ending with e3, and if I play rook e8, there's knight e4, maybe something like this occurs where I can't stop the pawn anymore, but it turns out there's king takes f5 and it's all fine. But I was a little concerned that maybe this is mess up territory already, especially with only two minutes on the clock. So I was a little concerned, but as a king e5, I knew that I was going to win because now these two pawns are both vulnerable and this king is not in the right spot. Someone needs to defend the c6 pawn. I play rook g8, the king has to move to f6, and now king c3, and now the knight has to leave, and the c6 pawn will be alone. Knight e2 check, king c4, f4, I simply take that pawn, knight takes, rook c8, knight e3, I take the pawn with check, and I move the rook away because of course I don't want to get forked, g5, I give a check first, then take on g5, h4, and f3 putting the nail in the coffin, or how, however you say it, um, because I'm giving a check, attacking that pawn, which is the only defender of that knight. If pawn takes, then king takes knight, and this is, of course, completely lost for black. So that's why my opponent did not take it, went for king takes g5, I took on e4, and my opponent tried some final tricks because I can see a world where someone blunders this, <laughs> especially if you carelessly play a move like b5 or something, and you, and you drop knight of 6 check. It's possible, especially when you're on one minute on the clock. <laughs> so I play rook hh. Uh, of course, I am very careful at this stage because I know the win is right there. I just need to make a few more careful uh, good moves. Knight of 6, king d4, because after knight takes e4, I take on h4 with check and uh, pick up the knight. So, of course, it's not played. King g4, e5. And after knight h5, I'm simply pushing the pawn and I take on h5 because after king takes, pawn pushes, and I promote with check. And that is why after rook takes h5, my opponent resigned. And you guys, this is my second ever Grandmaster Classical win in a classical over the board chess game. This is the second time I've been in Grandmaster and it feels so surreal! The first time was in 2017, almost seven years ago. Can you believe it? Can you imagine this? Like, this is completely insane. And that while I was so certain that the game was ending in a draw and I accepted my fate, I accepted that it's fine, I can't go on um, like this and try to risk things. I didn't really feel like risking it anymore. But my opponent did not want to take the draw and moved, uh, played on and allowed me to win. So I feel pretty lucky in a way, but I'm also really proud in a way about the way that I played. I really made it difficult for my opponent and my opponent had to make decisions that, um, yeah, were uh, quite you know challenging. So I'm really happy with my result. It, it feels surreal um, after not having such a great tournament uh, I was struggling a little bit in a few games, but now having this result makes me just really happy. And um, I'm going in with the, uh, to the last round with a, in a really good mood. I was really ready to fight today as well. For some reason, I was really ready to fight and um, I wanted to make the best out of it. So yeah, I'm going to enjoy this victory. I'm so, so happy, but we still have to play a game tomorrow. So I'm going to do my best. It is the last round tomorrow and I'm going to give it all to finish on a nice score. So, with that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for all the love and support. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope to see you guys in the next video.